I remember when I was at university, the brothers who were like maybe 10 years older than me, they were like, you know, yeah, we used to have, we used to do anything. We used to walk around like we owned the place where you could, you know, so confident that they were, you know, they, they, uh, one, one brother said we actually did a football tournament with big banners, you know, raising money for the Mujahideen. <laughs> Assalamu alaikum and welcome to this Back to Uni special uh, episode of the Unscripted Podcast. I'm uh, Salman Bhatt and with us we have uh, a few folks from FOSIS, uh, the Federation of Islam Students Islamic Societies, uh, Inam Ahmed, the President, and uh, Ijlal Khalid, the Vice President. Mashallah. Assalamu alaikum guys. I think after so many years I'd know how to, uh, I know what FOSIS stood for. Uh, I was actually part of FOSIS uh, in 2010 and 11, I think, uh, so 10 years ago. Yeah, I think I was there for a year or two. I was I was the uh, London chair, London the, chair, the National Executive Committee. Yeah, it was fun, alhamdulillah. Uh, but yeah, we wanted to get you guys on here because we wanted to get a, uh, uh, a proper, authentic perspective and some advice to uh, four people going back to uni or people whose family members are going back to uni this year so it's quite a, a unique uh, I think time for uh, for students at university because they're paying loads of money for probably sitting at home and <laughs> attending lectures via zoom or something <laughs> what do you guys reckon what what how are you guys uh, preparing for uh, this new new style of university education at uh, um, yeah, no, like I was saying, I'll let, I let Ijlal sort of actually um, elaborate on it. So from our side as forces, we're, we, we completely recognize that it's going to be a completely different year for Muslim students on the ground. It's going to be a completely different year for ISOCs and the general ISOC activities. I think all of us who remember Fresh as being um, the halal version for us mm-hmm. and just, you know, going out with the bros and doing all sorts. But this year, obviously, those things probably won't happen. So. Ijlal Alhamdulillah has done a fantastic piece of work which actually kind of lays out for ISOCs all the different challenges that they will face, lays out for Muslim students all the different um, things that they need to take into consideration. So I actually pass over to Ijlal who can probably elaborate more on these kind of things and what the word is out on the street for, for Muslim students and ISOCs. Yeah, no, Jazakum no khair for that. Um, and um, I think, yeah, no, you're right. Like, we all know that what an ISOC year looks like and it, there's no doubt that this year is really different. I think we need to understand like with with COVID comes a lot of issues that perhaps ISOCs haven't dealt with in the past as well. There's a lot of issues around welfare, a lot of issues around access that previously haven't really been there. Um, if if a lot of students like Muslim students who are from lower socioeconomic backgrounds, firstly, if they're studying online, there is a digital divide as well, which is which is there along racial lines, which is there along uh, socioeconomic lines. So they would be experiencing that as well. So just access to the internet or access to the right mm. technology, if you're studying online, it becomes a major issue. So what happens for ISOX is that you have, and you know, we did, we did even have, you know, these issues around A-level predicted grades and all of those things. What that does is that from the first onset, like you don't really have the same level of membership or engagement with your membership as an ISOC. You have, you know, fewer Muslim students perhaps coming to university. You have fewer Muslim students engaging with the things that are being put out by the university or the students union um mm. if it's an online in, in an online domain um i mean i've been hearing you know in the last week or so as freshers have started um for a lot of universities um you know people are doing things online but not everyone has the same level level of access to those things in terms of an isoc um you know an isoc would have to deal with a lot of different things mm. that perhaps weren't really um you know they weren't really doing dealing with those things previously there's things like um you know having to deal with bereavement having to deal with issues around um you know losing a family member or experiencing covid yourself uh, and then giving the right mental health support the right well-being support is something that isocs um are experiencing in addition to that like I think one of the, as we understand it in forces, one of the core uh, purpose of an ISOC is there to have uh, a transformative Islamic environment for your Muslim mm. students when they're on uh, campuses. But with prayer rooms, you know, perhaps operating under the guidelines where not a lot of people would be able to do a lot of socializing or, you know, meet in numbers within prayer rooms or within social spaces, you're lacking that sort of community building, you're lacking that social cohesion, which 
creates a community, which creates uh, which creates relationships that can lead to transformation. Um, you know, people will act, you know, one of the things that I predicted in the impact assessment that I created was that there might even be an imam dip because people don't really have the same level of resources available yeah. to them as they did previously. As engagement and mem membership of ISOCs might go down, what might happen is that people wouldn't have really anywhere to um, go to get their, you know, get their torbiya, get, find mm. an Islamic environment. And, you know, like they, there are some places in the country where people would have access to masajid and Muslim communities. But for a large uh, for a large majority of students in a lot of parts of the in a lot of parts of the country, they don't really have access to those things. And they rely on their ISOX to give them that environment which helps them develop as better Muslims. So we really see like that starts to erode, that community starts to erode, that membership and engagement that an ISOC has, it starts to erode. Community cohesion becomes more difficult. You have more welfare issues come up. Uh, and evidently, there's stuff around securitization and surveillance as well. Uh, you know, we see with things moving in an online domain, um, simple things like, you know, engaging in a classroom, having discussions and debate around uh, whether it be government policies or foreign policy and things like that. Like personally for myself, I studied international relations and development uh, for my bachelor's and then my master's in political economy. But some of the things that I studied were around the security surve surveillance systems and mechanisms that exist within the state structure. And for me to actively have an academic debate around those things, there is a level of critical um, a lens that you have to apply as well. But in an online domain where everything is being logged, everything is being recorded, whether through Zoom or through any other online platform, <laughs> and whether any sort of uh, conversations and debate that you're mm. having um, is within a university's <clears throat> online platform, um, uh, then everything is monitored, everything is surveilled. So we really see that it, it sort of disciplines academic dissent as well. But I think yeah, these are just some yeah. of the things that I highlighted in the impact assessment that amongst others as well. But naturally, it's, it's a very different year to previous years. I mean, years. I remember, I mean, I was at uni for a long time, yeah, I think like 10 years or something. And Fresh's time was always a very, very important time to kind of, you know, a bunch of uh, new students are are here. They, you know, they, they're being pulled in every direction, you know, this club and that club, and people are calling him to go out um, clubbing and drinking and, and uh, doing all, all manner of madness, yeah. But that was our time as the ISOC. Okay, you need to extend that, you know, a relationship. You need to let people know where's the prayer room and, and so on and so forth. And many people, I saw many, many cohorts come and go. And alhamdulillah, you know, uh, university is a time where you see transformation, you see evolution. You know, I saw like people come as monkeys and leave as men, alhamdulillah, right? But you might see the uh, the opposite as well, you know, um, that will I protect us that you know people come with you know a certain uh, level of commitment to Islam and practicing uh, you know Muslim confident in Islam but maybe sometimes they get a bit too um, you know they have maybe tarbawi issues or identity issues and they 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 lose some of their uh, the symbols of Islam and so forth um, so that's why this you know uh, freshers and the first few weeks and months of university was always very critical and it's um, it's it's heartening to know that you know online you can reach maybe potentially reach more people more students you know uh, and no doubt Islamic societies are doing things online um, you know I, I was invited to speak somewhere as well just online I was like do I have to do anything <laughs> just sit down and, and speak I don't mind yeah uh, but the real thing you know that we used to encourage was the the social kind of get-togethers mm -hmm. you know just go out w see the sites or whatever in the city um, get that uh, that bonding done you know brothers with brothers sisters, with sisters. Uh, and that's really you know a, a really uh, uh, important thing that's probably going to take a hit so what are you seeing that ISOCs are or what are you encouraging maybe ISOCs universities to do to try and bridge that you know um, that social that that camaraderie that fraternity um, gap because of the uh, the pandemic do you, uh, do you want to speak to that, Inam, or do you want me to? I mean, it's it's hard. So on the ground, um, loads of ISOCs are approaching in a, in different ways. Some ISOCs yeah. are sort of taking up a quite a hybridized approach where they recognize you can't do everything in person, but at the same time, taking everything online doesn't really work. Um, in the first week, you might have 50 people attend, and by week two, 
it's just the convenience of being at home. But is there um, actually not... is there actually uh, stuff happening on campus, or is everything has everything gone to online or? Uh, in I terms think, of people's just university courses and stuff, universities are open as usual for some degrees, I'm assuming, like degrees that require, you know, people to come in for like medicine or, you know, for lab, lab work and stuff like that. Yeah, I think it varies quite a lot, to be mm. honest. There, uh, Obviously, like for lab based courses, uh, there are things in person, there is teaching yeah. in person. Um, for a lot of them, for the other ones, I think for, again, universities, different universities are doing different things. Some are going for a blended mm. learning approach. You know, some things are online. Um, you come in for like certain lectures and seminars and so, um, okay. in some weeks, uh, but that varies. In terms of ISOCs as well, I think, again, ISOCs are using like a hybridized approach as well. You have certain mm. cases where they might do a certain event um, in a socially distant manner, which the SU has allowed them to do. But then in a lot of other cases, um, different SUs have taken a position to say that, you know, we don't want our societies to do things online, oh, sorry, uh, in person, because person, it's just yeah. difficult to manage. There's a threat and a risk there as well, which mm. they don't perhaps feel confident that, that they can like mitigate against that. Uh, so you do have that as well, and it varies, I think, yeah. across the board. And I'm going to cut you off earlier. What were you saying then? So uh, you were saying a mixed approach. Yeah, it's, so it, it's, it, re it really depends <laughs> On which university you go to, mm. how the SU is navigating its relationship with all of its student unions. Um, so the vast majority of ISOCs have taken things online. Um, some ISOCs, I can name a few in London, who, for example, they're doing maybe socially distanced like meet and greets or going around the city. But I mean, the, the prime minister just had announced <laughs> new changes today, so yeah. I don't even know what's going to happen. And I think that's I think that's the thing that a lot of ISOCs and the ISOC leadership and even Muslim students are slightly concerned about, you know, with ever-changing terrain, you know, what does it mean for mm. Islamic society to build that community that the three of us, you know, fondly remember? Um, but, but, you know, I think there is, there is a lot of yeah. experimentation currently going on and we're learning from one another. And I think one thing that FOSIS has started and we're doing is we, we do these things like, um, they're like round table discussions. So what we mm -hmm. do is we invite um, ISOC leadership um, to join us for an online conversation where literally it's just them sharing their own experiences. One ISOC may say, oh, this is what we're doing. So yeah. one, uh, I think it was Cambridge or was it Oxford? They, because they, they're they quite unique in the sense that they're all like different. It's like Harry Potter, isn't it? Like, yeah, <laughs> Slytherin and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. So <laughs> they have Trinity College and why have you not? Yeah. So I've learned the way their university is functioning is if you belong in a house, that is your social bubble or your mm. your bubble. So therefore, those houses they're able to do like certain activities and so on and so forth. But they're not allowed to mix between um, colleges. So there's le lots of learning that's happening, and we're trying our best anyway to facilitate that yeah. conversation and learn as much as we can from the ground. I think a lot of the solutions come from the ground. No, and I think that's quite key actually to ensure that we are sort of letting ISOX create some semblance of a social community on the ground and giving mm. them different ways and mechanisms to do that. We did like mm. uh, publish like a, a range of different <clears throat> guidances in which we outlined how an ISO can go out and build a community online and ensuring that, you know, you're constantly communicating with your members, you're understanding mm. how things are evolving for them as well. Because mm. the other thing is ISOCs actually have to respond to the needs of the community, right? They have to provide the services and the welfare, look after the welfare of their students yeah. and their welfare issues that their students are experiencing now keep on changing as well based on the current COVID context. Salam guys, sorry to butt in, eh? but if you're enjoying this podcast, please head over to islamtunnelc.com forward slash donate to help us make more. And if you're not enjoying it, head over anyway and help us make better ones. So what are the, what are the, uh, the, the, the kind of major challenges of, of uh, ISOCs and Muslim students now, you reckon, other than uh, those directly r related to COVID, um, you know, those are the kind of obvious ones. So, what, what's the kind yeah. of because uh, the thing is, imagine if somebody is an ISOC uh, in an ISOC, they're watching and they feel a bit maybe um, detached from everyone else. It's just if they know that you know other people are other ISOCs are going through certain uh, issues, similar things, and they they might you know benefit from um, what you have to say about that and. Um, you know, get in touch and and uh, be part of these roundtable discussions. You know, so 
because sometimes it's quite a lonely thing you know if you're on isoc you've got your own stuff that you're trying to you know um mm. desperately get done um just having that understanding of what 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 are the the challenges uh for isocs and muslim students you reckon going forward um i mean so if you guys go into the forces website we've actually mm -hmm. published um what uh guidance is called a COVID-19 impact assessment and it kind of quite nicely summarizes oh, okay. the area. Um, so, I mean, there's about six, seven areas. So the first one is like just general membership and engagement. The, mm. This loss of everything where you get this massive cohort of people coming in and now you'd have no guarantee that you can even reach out to those people because during Freshers Week, everyone got a Freshers bag. Everyone came into the Freshers Fair. Yeah. So I think a lot of ISOCs <clears> are now trying to deal with that by doing online Freshers Week. Uh, Focus has produced uh, pressure packs, so online pressure packs that people can download, um, and then that gives them lots of tools and little freebies that they can use. Second one is just general community and the loss of community. That's probably the second mm. biggest challenge. Um, you know, lack of communal spaces, prayer rooms being one of them, being either monitored, restricted. You know, the community will have some sort of impact, and a lot of ISOCs again are now experimenting on how they can take that community experience either online or through other settings. The third big one probably for most ISOCs will just be activities. Um, yeah. All of us remember Freshers Week, Discover Islam Week, doing different types of charity work, so on and so forth. All of those things now, you know, we don't know what's going to happen, especially for this part of the term until Christmas. Um, so again, a lot of people, those are probably the biggest changes that are going to happen. Spirituality mm -hmm. and Tadbir, I think, mm -hmm. um, Ijlal touched upon that, that just not being around brothers and sisters being around sisters has a massive impact on your, on just your Iman. And for especially people who live out, ISOC's often the only place where they can mix with other Muslims. So yeah. I think that's something a lot of ISOC leadership now have to think about. You know, these people who are still moving out and living out, how do we reach them? How can we ensure that these people are being catered for and looked after? Um, welfare kind of leads on to that. Welfare then becomes the next big thing. Mental health. Um, we've heard cases of obviously not everyone comes from stable homes or has you know issues at home that can have a massive impact on a person's mental health and their own welfare again these are challenges that we as a as forces and ISOC need to look towards and then Islam you know went into a lot of detail around sort of the securitization element of it you know Muslims have been under the scrutiny and I think yeah. this pandemic has provided ample opportunity for universities and the wider sort of infrastructure um to really hone in on ISOC and I think there was a report that was released just the other day by the Adam Smith Institute which was kind of talking about this idea that, you know, there's a political shift now and that actually student unions should avoid funding niche activities. Um, and we, as forces, we, we believe that will affect mainly some societies. <laughs> uh, ISOCs, you know, the ability for ISOCs mm. to get to do, I don't know, an Islamic activity will be viewed under that report as a niche activity. So these are kind of like the big challenges that are coming our way. And to be fair, the only way we can work on it is a working together sharing from my experiences yeah. and really united in the in this in this time um and isocs if they feel alone then it's really important for them to realize that they are not alone like these issues mm. have been identified we're trying to express it to isocs and they need to come forward and you know a seek out help and be give any advice and support that they've already learned from their own experiences i mean i've heard so, anecdotally from brothers and sisters um across the years that ISOCs are getting more and more um, kind of battered into a position of uh, just censoring themselves and being mm. um, a kind of a, a culture of self-censorship and a culture of feeling um, feeling that they can't really do what they want to do. And um, whether it's through um, creative kind of uh, suggestions from the Adam Smith Institute or whether it's, you know, things like prevent. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I don't know how much of this is kind of old fogey or back in my day, we used to be things used to be much better. But I mean, I remember when I was at university, the brothers who were like, maybe 10 years older than me, they were like, you know, yeah, we used to have we used to do anything we used to walk around like on place we could, you know, so confident that they were, you know, they, they uh, one, one brother said we actually did a football tournament with big banners, you know, raising money for the Mujahideen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, to send for, you know, Bosnia or the uh, Afghan-Soviet war or something, you know. Back when jihad was cool, yeah, and it was kind of socially acceptable. 
Uh, but then obviously 9-11 and 7-7, that kind of happened whilst I was uni uh, at university. So we saw the, 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 the kind of uh, uh, initial push for a bit of securitization and stuff. But um, we were really kind of radical back then. And, and radical to me is a good thing anyway. And there was a lot of, a lot of um, you know, um, different kind of societies pushing for, uh, you know, thinking, thinking differently and stuff and, and holding power to account and stuff. At Imperial, we had a um, we had a society they called Imperial against Imperialism. <laughs> really cheesy, but it was really like you know those kind of lefty uh, kind of uh, yeah. fight the power kind of people, and um, yeah, they're a good bunch of people. And you know we used to do joint uh, events with them and that kind of stuff. But then over the years, a lot of people have said that, uh, especially because of prevent get, getting becoming. Uh, or, or being pushed as though it was something uh, a statutory statutory duty on universities that ISOCs have uh, and generally students have um, kind of toned down the radicalism in the good with the good kind of radicalism you know just um, mm. you know um, challenging orthodox views thinking uh, thinking what could be and 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 experimenting with the ideas and 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 uh, uh, thoughts and stuff at university. Um, and one brother said that you know they don't even in their eyes they don't even bother calling any any external speakers anymore because they have to go through so many jump through so many hoops as the Islamic society and they were like oh there's no point we'll just you know you give you 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 give a lecture to us tomorrow or whatever so it's like young people lecturing each other and I was hoping that was just maybe a one-off kind of uh, case but. Um, they mm. th prevent it was it did have a you know um, at least anecdotally an impact on um universities and and students feeling uh you know confident com comfortable and confident to uh, um to speak their views and stuff and the case that we took against the government i think that um that highlighted that i mean the government's argument its defense was well it's not a statutory really it's not we're not forcing you to take into account this guidance uh, all you have to do is you know have due regard to it and then just ignore it so and we found that there was a very big broad range of uh, universities with respect to how seriously and literally they took prevent duty guidance uh, mm. from the government some of them outright they said you know we don't need it we've got our own policies and just you know chuck it in the bin some of it kind of adopted it more literally um, and it's those universities that I won't mention any names that tended to have more kind of restrictive, um, restrictive kind of policies um, that that make students feel that they can't really express themselves or invite this X Y Z speaker. Is that so? My question to you guys is: Is that a fair or a statistically significant assessment of the of the situation, or is it just a few scary examples? And you know things are kind of okay. You know Muslim students are confident and uh, you know radical in the good sense. I think there's like personally, I feel like there's there's a few things there. I feel like on the ground, people do in people do experience things, and when they experience these things, you know the the chilling effect, not being that open, or like limiting who you invite those sort of things they are always tied to other wider national things that are happening as well again like what universities or SUs might be doing is again tied to things like this uh, Adam Smith Institute report that came out with a lot of MPs you know giving evidence um, in the report itself as well it is a shift um, from like some you know a right-wing um, sort of uh, discourse which creates this idea that students unions these niche activities, as they call them, are, you know, students unions are radical, they are very critical, they are very campaigns, organizing oriented, they should be more like service providers, service based organizations, similar performing a similar function to, you know, how a university's uh, student experience directorate performs, like just fulfill those services, just, you know, look after, um, you know, what students need. And that's it. That That is mm. where the investment should be going. That is where the money should be going. So I think, yeah, a lot of universities then with, um, because funding is tied to it as well, right? And then student unions funding is tied to it as well. And then in a lot of cases, universities are holding your, their student unions to account as well. So it's like those layers that then do affect what an ISOC does and what a Muslim student does at, uh, on the ground. 
Um, so yeah, that is definitely there, and I think it's not like a few really extreme examples. This is basically the sector. It's basically what's happening in the sector, mm-hmm. and I think with uh, when we try and understand how universities or students unions deal with it a lot of times it's the for them it's the way off between you know freedom of speech or security and uh, safety mm. i mean you know prevent is now it's approached in a safeguarding lens as well so it's that's the way off that's created freedom of speech or safety so in that sense isox do find themselves you know increasingly oh you know that speaker we have a zero tolerance policy we don't really want you to invite that person because we don't want any uh, in the interest of everyone's safety and safeguarding. This is what you have to do. Uh, so, yeah, I think that freedom of speech argument can go both ways. It can be something that restricts what ISOCs do as well uh, by saying that, you know, an ISOC and a lot of ISOCs actually campaign. A lot of ISOCs have campaigns around prevent as well, around mm. preventing prevent. And in in these in this ASI report, or you know, saying that these are niche activities that students unions should not be funding, university money should not be uh, used towards, then you're taking away an ISOC's ability to even do that. So in some instances, you are actually limiting their voice in inviting the speakers they want to invite. In you know, being a Muslim student, being confident in your identity, and it, practicing islam while you're on campus in some cases but then in other cases what's happening is if you if you break through that and then you as an isoc are campaigning against prevent to actively challenge it on university campuses what this discourse is doing now is actually problematizing that as well that that is, and we see it happen through the henry jackson society we through we see it happen through uh, this asi report like you know it, through that discourse is constructed that this is what students unions are funding this is what isocs are doing and we need to control them we need to monitor them so it reifies that entire prevent narrative that we need to surveil and monitor these students and these societies even more mm. so i think yeah it's uh, from uh, how i see it it's definitely something that is a part of the wider discourse and the I wider suppose, shift right now i suppose if these uh think tanks are still spending a lot of money and <laughs> energy in trying to trying to kind of uh, quell dissent then i suppose it's still it's still a good sign that there is some there are some embers mm. of uh you know uh of critical thinking and and uh and and um, defiance, you know, uh, on campus, which is a kind of a, a, a good sign, I think. Um, I mean, the, the irony is those who those who are, and this is this applies to Islamic societies, universities, unions, or your local whatever masjid or anything, and it's that those who um, take prevent seriously, those who give it the time of day, give, give its practitioners a bit of, uh, you know, a bit of uh, attention and, and, and credibility. It's those who end up getting more and more and more um, kind of put under the thumb and more uh, under more and more scrutiny, right? Mm. It's a bit like bailiffs, I, I, I normally t- or TV licensed people. If you open the door and let them in, then they can just come and uh, make themselves comfortable. But if you just say, "Sorry, I'm not interested," go to the next, uh, you know, uh, poor, uh, uh, gullible person. Then they'll just they'll just uh, they normally just take the path of least resistance, you know. And that's a very important lesson we need to um, uh, kind of reaffirm of just people being confident, knowing their rights, knowing that you have absolutely no need to take these, uh, you know, people seriously. You don't need to invite them into your, you don't need to go bend over backwards or go out of your way to prove that you're somehow not a threat. It's actually, a, that, that's that's a racist uh, assumption and racist kind of pretext of, of, of that, that, uh, that lens of suspicion. Uh, you don't have to prove anything. You can just, you know, be be yourself. Feel confident in your own skin as Muslims. Do you know uh, host uh, events that you that you uh, want to host? Make make sure it's you know uh, something that your 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 members actually want and member members actually need. And and don't fear, you know, the um, uh, the uh, what people will say. Right. I mean, obviously, exercise wisdom, but. If you if you try and uh, say okay, I'm not going to invite those people or let's not talk about this or um, and it's something that is important for you, then you've done the the job of uh, of uh, you know the people that are trying to. Uh, that's why they call it a chilling effect, you know, to to make people uh, scared into a a a, a um, an atmosphere of self censorship, you know. Um, which is very, very problematic for many other reasons, and ultimately it makes us less safe. Even, 
even the securitization argument um you know there's 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 overwhelming evidence to show that actually quelling people's ability to express um uh, or uh, uh you know radical political sentiment is actually one of the causes empirically determined causes of political violence you know we see that historically in in, in the, all over the place whether it's you know anti vietnam war demonstrators or uh you know um uh, student uh, activists or you know whatever when 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 radical uh political kind of uh groups they feel that you know the pen has failed and they're not able to you know express themselves that's when a very small minority of turn to the you know dynamite sticks or whatever um so on, on all counts there's, there's there's absolutely no reason to give uh prevent uh, mm -hmm. And its underlying kind of um, epistemology, uh, any any uh, any credible kind of uh, attention, and uh, I, I mean, I'm on a few uh, WhatsApp groups and stuff w w of just researchers uh, about Prevent. Um, not that I'm a researcher about it, but they just added me because I could to 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 um, to help here and there or to to keep keep my kind of finger on the pulse and. It's a broad consensus now amongst pretty much the whole academy that uh, it's it's a bit of a disaster, but unfortunately mm. there's always a bit of a delay, um, you know, between between uh, research and policy. So the people at universities they need to get that message again and again that you don't need to feel that you know you're tre treading on uh, eggshells and you have to be very careful and you know. Um, uh, prove somehow you're not a threat to uh, to anyone. Just just be yourself. Be confident uh, in your skin as Muslims. You know. Um, I did want to ask as well about what are what are some of the other kind of broader non-pandemic related uh, issues. So we spoke about prevent securitization and stuff. Um, what are the kind of uh, the issues that ISOCs come to you? Uh, as FOSIS or even on a personal level uh, about uh, you know I'm you're smiling <laughs> <laughs> I think there is I think ISOX um, they reflect what really the whole Muslim community is going through um, they're not really unique in that regard mm. whether it's affecting the Muslim community is affecting ISOX like the prevent example mm. that, that that silenced the whole community let alone just ISOX and then ISOX kind of just follow to them they they silence themselves i think the one common thing that we're now having to um help isoc navigate is this whole conversation conversation around sort of the shift was very liberal politics very liberal identity type politics yeah um how do you navigate it? like every every other day it's like um it's a scandal or there's just something that we need to change our dps for um you know there's something going on like and I saw some so for all the all the old fogies out there, DP is your display picture. Yeah, I know <laughs> uh, we young people know that, but just so you know. Yeah. So it, it's just that, like you know, what the ne whatever the next Twitter beef is, you kind of I saw find themselves in the middle of that. Um, and the membership are often again very much influenced by that. They don't realize that the the world we grow up in, liberalism. And the very sort of radical liberal thinking is the air that we literally breathe. Yeah. Um, what we consume is it becomes part of our identity. And I think a lot of Muslims face like an identity crisis in some way, shape, or form, where they really believe, for example, in in the rights of of like like a common one um, is uh, that recently happened was the whole Black Lives Matter thing. Um, you know, this conversation around racism in in within within wider society but then also this yeah. conversation around racism in the muslim community that became really big for muslim students to tackle isocs to tackle you had conversation around women's rights again so do you mean community. you mean um muslims approaching this through the prism of of uh un-islamic kind of um, um groups and and uh political philosophies presumably yeah. not i mean that is really what it comes down to like yeah. Often, I, this one thing I've learned, people often have very valid points. It's just the prism they're approaching it from leads them to very invalid conclusions. And I think that's something mm -hmm. that leadership has to convey because the other thing I've learned is people just like whacking people on the on the head with a label or with 
or with, oh, no, you're on some next bar till, and they don't actually listen to whatever the complaint is from the complainant. And often people have very valid concerns, um, but it's this issue. They, they approach it from a lens or a prism that has already presupposed assumptions, mm -hmm. often in direct contradiction to Islam. So then when they end up in the conclusion, they themselves are confused. Hold on a minute, I believe this, but then Islam has something else to say. And then you end up in long conversation and pragma trying to undo all those assumptions validate their concerns which are often very legitimate yeah. and then provide an islamic solution for that and islamic i, I was having to do that on mass muslim students are having this conversation on mass and uh, no one's really at this moment in time given them a a sacred mm. islamically conducive honest answer for that and that's what really a lot of muslims are looking for Assalamu alaikum guys, me again, reminding you to head over to islam21c.com forward slash donate to keep the lights on on Islam21c. We pride ourselves on being independent and being funded by the grassroots community. Do you think it's linked to the previous issue of the chilling effect and, and the, the dearth of Islamic kind of scholars coming onto the campuses? Um, so what, there's a vacuum there, Muslim need, Muslims need to get, they want to see someone or people with some knowledge speaking about the pressing issues whether it's racism whether it's uh whatever uh kind of political uh, issues or social issues if they don't see um someone talking about it from an islamic perspective they're going to see people who are maybe left wing or on some issues right wing people or whatever um kind of speaking or liberals kind of speaking on it uh, speaking about it from that perspective and um um, I think that's true. Like there is, while there is a vacuum in which all of these things are emerging, you know, and they're it's sort of getting out of control of Muslim students and ISOPs mm -hmm. as well. I think on the other end, we also need to realize like it's very strategically being constructed by prevent mechanisms again. You know, we have had a lot of fake Instagram profiles and things like that, which have been constructed to influence the Muslim mind, to influence people from a discourse that is not rooted in a Quran mm -hmm. Sunnah framework. And that's where we find ourselves like that's what's lacking and i think it's again like it's at the it uh, the way i see it like, what i call it is like people end up following muslim student culture they they're not really understanding yeah. are we deriving <clears throat> our uh, our rationalities our epistemologies and the way we conceptualize things from a quran a sunnah framework or are we just following what other isocs are doing what other groups of people are doing and the way the whole uh, thing or the whole thing is trending following these trends it's just following this muslim student culture and i think that's something very yeah. very core cool that forces does as well is to try and teach isocs to be very uh, vision oriented to be very purposeful in what they do to try and root and ground everything in the Quran and Sunnah and that's I think that's one of the major projects that forces has going forward to ensure that our socks are approaching things and we we are teaching them that vacuum that we just spoke about we're trying to fill that vacuum we're trying to mm -hmm. fill that void and forces has launched like you know a development program we we sort of assess our socks we sort of uh, you know help them give guidance as well through these frameworks and through this lens because again like you know a lot of times what happens is we uh, isox with the blm stuff with these all these other things you, you see one isoc do one thing and that's it all the other isocs are going to follow suit you see muslim some muslim celebrities or muslim uh, influencers come out and do one thing that's yeah. it the entire muslim community is going to do that so i think like we in a lot of cases in the west we might have detached from nationalist discourses and our you know um ethnic discourses but we're still very much caught within another cultural discourse that is very up uh, very up and active right now which we need to fight in a way and even like you know in in the quran allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says um i think it's surah sad uh allah says in uh, he describes what are the best of people the people who are the most vision oriented and the most uh, powerful of people the people of power and people of vision uh, in Surah Sad, uh, and he describes uh, Ishaq alayhi salam, uh, Yaqub alayhi salam, Ibrahim alayhi salam, that wadhqur ibadihi, like those were the people who who constantly remember, who were servants of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They constantly re remembered Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They always found themselves mm -hmm. doing those things. So that is their, and their vision in life was tied to their remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You can't be someone who is very vision oriented or wants to do a lot of things and wants to achieve X, Y, and Z. If you haven't 
tied that to a remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's what mm. we're lacking in the Muslim community, in my opinion. We have a lot of people who are very eager to do things and take up these positions of responsibility and these big mantles, but they're not the ones who might be tied to a remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, true servitude to Allah. And I think this is what I say to ISOX and Muslim students as well. Like, you're not serving students, you're not serving the community, you're serving Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ulul Aidi wal Absar, like those are the people of vision and strength that we should be taking as our models, you know, linking mm. everything to our, to what we want in the Akhirah, which is to see the face of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and linking it to the servitude of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to linking it mm. to ibadah of Allah. And this is what yeah. we try and create through forces as yeah. well. I mean, I think part of it, so the, uh, you're right, uh, Ilam, that uh, what's happening in ISOX is just a reflection or a slice of what's happening in the wider community. And um, we discuss this on different, uh, with different brothers and sisters and groups uh, uh, in, in kind of DAO organizations as well, you know, in, take Black Lives Matter, for example. Um, some people were very, uh, obviously, nobody disagrees that lives of black people matter hopefully they shouldn't they might do they might they may not indeed but at least you know they agree in, in principle in in uh in cognitively that you know this is uh this is a racism problem and so forth but some people were a bit um uncomfortable with some of the kind of um uh, more mm-hmm. left-wing elements and and uh, maybe underlying world view of of the political organizations uh, mm. Officially affiliated with Black Lives Matter, um, but then again, um, there's also the threat of of in reacting to that, we end up making the un-Islamic basis our basis for yeah. thinking and and, uh, and and activism as well, because exactly. um, I found some people uh, in the Dawa as well. In order to, uh, to kind of distance themselves from the the liberal bases of BLM, they ended up taking an equally un-Islamic, <laughs> you know, uh, very similar to just a right-wing modernist um, basis of uh, of operation. I.e., in order to distance themselves from the post-modernists, they became modernists themselves. Uh, you know, accepting things like race. Um, mm. Denying things like uh, uh, the, the 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 constructedness of race, or uh, you know mm. the the, uh, uh, the a few elements that they accuse you know um, people who are a bit too radical in the postmodernist camp to be. So they they end up um, maybe pe- swinging the pendulum the other way. And I said to them that, or about them that. Um, Sometimes in running away from a, a an Islamic epistemology or a way of looking at things, we end up running into the arms of uh, an equally un Islamic epistemology or way of looking at things. Yeah. And that we should be very, very careful. And it's always it's one of my pet peeves of of Muslims wandering into debates between rival non Muslim factions and taking a side, right? Um, whether it's left wing or right wing. You yeah. don't need to. Uh, so Muslims might think, oh, I don't like these right, left-wing people. Uh, I'm going to be a right-wing person, right? They won't admit it, but in their in the the, the discourse that they they uh, operate in, in the metaphors they use, in the arguments they use, they'll end up doing it. Or they, I don't like this right-wing person. I'm going to become left-wing. Mm. Now, eventually, um, the, the 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 ideal is for us to. You know, uh, inculcate in the community a, a confidence to do our own politics, our own, you know, political philosophy, our own thinking, and all that kind of stuff. But if you do come across now a Muslim who is kind of, uh, you know, self-described as a left-wing Muslim or a right-wing Muslim or a post-modernist Muslim or a modernist Muslim or whatever, I think part of the 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 the, the thing that fuels uh, the problematic aspects of these affiliations is uh, the way we react to those uh, yeah. brothers and sisters. Yeah. So um, because the whole and it's 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 algorithmic now, right? It's it, it's mediated by social media algorithms, the YouTube, Facebook, 
uh, mostly, right? Whatever you Google. Uh, and that is geared towards polarizing people, right? Mm. If somebody might be a bit, someone might have just said, for example, uh, and this is this is what we get from our own tradition of fiqh al khilaf, right? Of understanding and and how to deal with differences of opinion and 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 in a practical sense, right? Uh, of for example, don't push someone, don't push your opponent, your interlocutor, uh, further into his or her own position, right? This is one of the principles. Uh, what happens if we might, you know, someone might. Uh, uh, from a you know okay share a black mar- go on a black lives matter march or something right somebody who is uncomfortable with maybe some of the uh un-islamic roots of some organizations that are affiliated with black lives matter or the official blah blah blah, blah line whatever it is they might think say uh, in their harshness to condemn that person going on that march and not making excuses for that person for example or sharing whatever hashtag um they might th- say, you know, you're wrong. So that person naturally is going to say, what? No, you're wrong. <laughs> right, I'm right. They'll say, no, no, this is this is wrong. They say, you shouldn't be sharing this thing. Uh, so they'll think, well, w- what's wrong with sharing that? And automatically they'll start to what justify themselves or start to look for an excuse or um, and go deeper and deeper into that opinion. And even Islamically, kind of theologically, there are so many disputes that literally... Uh, arose because of argumentation, right? Someone mm-hmm. was teetering on the edge, you know, uh, dabbling with something from this philosopher or that that thinker, and because of the reaction they got, that made them more and more um, kind of stubborn and and uh, kind of hardcore in their in their approach, right? Mm-hmm. So, is there a space for? I I, I think there should be a space for. Those Muslims who do ascribe left wing, right wing, whatever things that we disagree with necessarily, there should be a space for them to experiment, but then kind of keep keep their uh, uh, activism, keep their um, their uh, activities within you know a, a, a bit of a buffer zone, right? So we don't completely um, mm. forsake them, but we say you know. Whatever you want to be, and and another principle, we shouldn't be very strict with with terminology. Right? If someone wants mm. to, if someone says I'm left wing or whatever, you shouldn't jump to think, oh, they're communist, they're Maoist, they're Leninist or whatever, or, or completely hardcore, the, the the extreme. Make excuses for brothers and sisters. If someone says they're right wing, likewise. Um, Sometimes that that confrontation it pushes people and polarizes even more. And I think we need to have a, a discourse which is bringing people on a on a common uh, denominator. So what some people say is whatever you want to call yourself, whatever you want to you know experiment with, and whichever party or group or whatever, um, just make sure you have, for example, a, a group of brothers and sisters close to you. Yeah, that are advising you, giving you sincere advice that we advice which is based on love, not based on I'm waiting for you to make a mistake, <laughs> you know, so I can prove you, prove you, prove myself right or whatever. Or, uh, make sure you're close to the Quran, for example, you're understanding, you're, you're taking benefits, uh, lessons from the Quran, you know, gen, general principles and so forth. You're you're trying to uh, stay close, and people people will make mistakes and let people make you know uh, mistakes and learn. As well, not just uh, forsaking them, you know, and and I'm thinking is so that method is slightly different to saying we need to stop people going down these um, these routes. So there's two kind of possibilities we can do, right? We can try and erect a barrier and try and save as many people as we can, or we can make that barrier kind of a bit permeable and uh, just try and reach as many people as possible and keep good um, relationships with them as an ISOC for example yeah um, because I mean a lot of people in the Labour Party for example Muslims in the, uh, like card-carrying Labour members they feel you know maybe betrayed a bit by the the party or you know there's an article mm-hmm. coming soon I won't uh, spoil a surprise uh, about this you know somebody uh, writing an open letter a Muslim writing an open letter to the Labour Party, feeling that they don't belong 
you know that, that they don't um, they don't feel Muslims or uh, uh, yeah Muslim members are um, given equal kind of uh, uh, weight as human beings and their and their uh, principles and their beliefs and so forth. But I think part of me wants to say yeah let's stop Muslims going down these these paths. Part of me wants to say let's just let them um, let them experiment, but find ways to keep uh, you know keep them close. And 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 have them themselves use the Quran to navigate these, uh, navigate your politics. You know, um, it's a if a difficult one. It's a dis discussion that's happening uh, outside of universities as well, and it's something mm. happening in universities as well. But in universities, people are supposed to dabble in different weird and wacky, uh, mm. <laughs> especially political kind of uh, ideas and stuff. So I think maybe we should uh, be a bit. Mm, uh, a bit, um, you know, soft and cuddly with them. What do you reckon? It's a uh, again. I, I know Israel has strong opinions on this, and uh, I think we're both now speaking more from our own lens than focus. <laughs> <laughs> Too late for that disclaimer, uh, bro. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you know it is it. It's hard because, you, like for myself, I've seen brothers and sisters, people I've worked with dabble too far and you were there for them and you kept mm. them close and you always reminded them and it's it's one of those things i remember who i think it was sheikh ashraf he once said to me um sheikh uh, ibn Taymiyyah, he said you know, if you're going down a path and you see a black wolf no don't try to fight it <laughs> just turn around and go back the other way because even if you can fight the dog and go through the path you'll leave with scars mm. and i think sometimes in our <clears throat> desperate attempt to try to reconcile some of these uh, ideologies and you know assumptions it's just it's like I said it's the air we breathe so even for example the example that you gave when Muslims try to see these mm. postmodernists and their arguments they inadvertently go into the modernist camp and it's literally because the 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 space of argumentation is actually so narrow it's already predefined and we're actually not in a god-centric world we're actually in mm. a, a godless world so every argument is already predefined in that godlessness um, and I think really that's why I, I'm personally of the opinion that, and I said this many years ago, actually, to one of my forces communities, I said, the Sharia is very large and it's very broad. And it actually, it, it's like I said, there's so much khilaf in it. That which is of valid, you know, within the scope of valid opinion is actually so much. And that which is shad mm -hmm. is shad. It's so clear cut. Like, it's it's known as being shad. Hence why the definition of shad, you get it. Like, it's defined as weird because it's weird. And once you look at that, then actually that weird stuff, that's the red line, really. Yeah. And everything else that is left is a lot of Islam. 95% of Islam is left. And for the vast majority of Muslims, whether they define themselves as, I don't know, feminist or whatever, actually, if you take away the assumptions that, of that definition, mm. probably what they're saying falls within that 95% of Islamic yeah. you know, uh, jurisprudence, right? Um, and if you approach it from that lens, then actually the, the amount of people you can keep under the banner of Islam and within the community grossly, grossly increases. Yeah. I just think in order to get to that point, you require the entire community to mature very, very quickly. And a lot of the old sort of um, identity politics that we had, because I remember another brother, he was once sort of explaining to me, he said, you know, there must be a need for new nomenclature in the community because what's happened is, like, for example, before, you know, a thousand years ago, there was the fifth debate of Are you Hanafi, are you Hanbali, whatever. And then after that, then came sort of the tariqas and all the different tariqas that existed. And you know, some tariqas were Hanbali, some tariqas were Hanafi. So they had the addition of being Hanafi and then from this tariqa. And then there was, during the 1900s, um, you know, the, you had the emergence of all of these new schools of thought, right? Um, political schools, you know, are you Ikhwani, are you Hezb Tahiri, so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. And again, they had sort of allegiances. Um, and now I think post 9-11, and certainly now in post 2010, and all this new stuff that's going out, you're having areas of conversation. I, I know, like, for example, what it means to be Muslim, what it means to have an identity. And you're seeing divergences happening, even those historical groups. So once upon a time where maybe an Ikhwani and HT person couldn't sit in the same room, they're now probably agreeing on an idea of what <clears throat> identity politics and what it means to be Muslim. Yeah. And they, I think there needs to be a new type of nomenclature on these issues. And perhaps, a redrawing of the lines of... Uh... Yeah. yeah, redrawing the lines. And maybe the new line should be based upon 
a very broad definition of what the Sharia encompasses, and with that which is shahad and clear cut kufr, that's our red line. And anything within that we accept. So it doesn't matter if someone is too immature to drop a label. We don't care about the label. We look at the substance of what they're saying. And if the substance can be encompassed by Islam, then there in that, you have my loyalty and my allegiance. And this then takes you back to our old conversation around wala and bara. But even <laughs> those things are not no longer com- talked about because of the chilling effect that we and, as a community have had. Unfortunately, many people skip the wala and head to the straight for the bara. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. guys, last reminder I promise. Head over to islam21c.com forward slash donate to help this movement get to the next level. So we have genuine, high quality media articulating Islam in the 21st century and developing confident Muslims impacting the world for the better. The thing that bonds you as Muslims is so much more uh, operative and effective and important, right? Than the things that um, that that differentiates you, even if, even on issues of you know that aqidah or politics or whatever, you know, if somebody genuinely feels they want they some uh, allegiance, some uh, some wala to Allah, His Messenger, His Deen, uh, the Sharia, and generally speaking, you know, then uh, that person that that person shouldn't be just written off, you know. Um, mm. Uh, and and unity is a very important point on um, for the campus, right? Uh, unity and diff- and cooperation, in different uh, different levels, different um, you know uh, spheres, right? Uh, sometimes you want to build a consensus with all students, you know, against, for example, prevent. <laughs> sometimes yeah. you want to yeah. unite the you know the just the Muslims uh, on specific uh, you know uh, Islamic issues. Um, their identity, their uh, their sha'air, their symbols, their practices, and so forth. Um, so, the what you said about <clears throat> uh, I completely agree on the on the on the issue of when there is some kind of um, dichotomy that's born about because of the the the, the hegemonic or the the you know the 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 popular kind of discourse um, around us, left wing, right wing, postmodernist, modernist, or whatever. I think I would add that uh, that caveat, yeah, of where, where wherever you want to dabble, wherever you want to look at yeah, and and uh, experiment with. Um, fair enough, go ahead, but with the caveat that. Remember that these things, these categories, this t- discourse is born out uh, by human culture, uh, history, much of which doesn't really, that you don't share, <laughs> right? A lot of things are, you know, were, were imposed uh, on Muslim societies, you know, ways of thinking and so forth. Uh, but, you know, you should, at the same time as, as engaging in your activism, engaging in your um, your duties uh, and so forth. Try and keep a God-centered, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala-centered uh, approach. Uh, know that these boundaries—left wing, right wing, modernist, postmodernist, um, liberal, conservative—these are human constructs, invariably Western human constructs. Uh, we mm. could even go further and say white Western human constructs um, historically. Uh, and not to give them too much um, kind of metaphysical presence uh, in your life, right? Whether you're adopting it or whether you're you're futing it, right? Because think, both yeah. both both camps uh, end up giving it way too much uh, importance. Uh, I liken it to, you know how um, you know ria uh, ostentation, like worshiping when you're worshiping Allah or when you're worshiping and you want to be seen. Uh, by people, for example, obviously that's 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 bad. That's uh, against uh, the the principle of sincerity. But not doing something for fear of riyah is also riyah. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Not doing something because you're afraid you might be showing off to people is showing off to people. Why? Because you're still making the people's eyes, the people's gaze, your criterion. Um, mm for worship or not worship likewise running away from postmodernism or liberalism or feminism or whatever 
for the sake of running away from feminism and liberalism or postmodernism uh, can sometimes lead you into and something else uh, an equally problematic issue because you're giving that thing so much of um, uh, so much kind of epistemic weight in your life and your thinking uh, so what's the alternative just take these labels as just asma on some muha this is what one of the prophets is quoted as saying in the Quran about idols, right? These are just names you gave, right? Just mm. names, these terminologies, yeah. this, this, these constructs. Um, and rather, if your if your main priority is serving Allah, is giving, uh, glorifying Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, is Islam, right? Then these other isms and schisms and uh, and and philosophies and and, and political kind of um, uh, labels, they should deteriorate in your own estimation eventually, until then you don't really care much about them. That's very different from caring so much about them that you'll run regardless uh, away from one of them, maybe into another five or six problematic ones. Uh, and that's a, I think that's the goal that we should have. Uh, when we do allow, we do encourage people to experiment with different groups and you know uh, student societies and and ways of doing things. That they eventually um, their attachment to Islam, uh, to Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, to the Sharia, to the Quran, uh, to the Sunnah, uh, their attachment renders everything else so um, so insignificant almost that they don't really care if they ending if they end up being labeled by someone as a feminist or a liberal or this or that because their concern is whatever you know is is most faithful to the sunnah regardless because those accusing me it says more about them than it does about me right uh you know if if i in someone else's estimation i am an xyz label you know <clears throat> um so i'm i'm conscious of the time uh, I just wanted you guys to give just one more piece of advice, okay, for any students or would be students about to join uh, Star University uh, watching. Muslim students, who wants to go first? Okay. Um, yeah, I think my advice would be that as we've spoken about here, like it's really easy to fall into other discourse and epistemic bases uh, as they, they have a cultural hegemony around us. So it's really important to educate yourself on Quranic uh, and Sunnah-based discourses. That's mm -hmm. where we derive our, our understanding, <clears throat> our, our rationality from. So educate yourself on them. Try and build a closer relationship with Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. Because as we said, like all of these things, they are they are servitude. Uh, you're being a servant to these concepts and ideologies which have emerged from people. The only servitude that we should have is to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And our, our ideas, our morals, our principles, all of them emerge from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, and that is what should be at the core of what an ISOC does, or what a Muslim student does, is to know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You cannot submit yourself or be a servant of an entity that you do not know. So spend your time knowing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala yes you know you're going to be in university you're going to be pulled in all sorts of different directions this year might be different but you know you're here for a lot of years at university so you'll be pulled in a lot of different directions through your time but always remain centered uh, to you know having an Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala based consciousness uh, try and you know um, control yourself. Try and educate yourself. It's a matter of tarbiya as well. Sometimes yes, you slip up. Some sometimes people make mistakes. Sometimes mistakes are needed to be made as well to learn. Uh, mm. That's part of tarbiya. So it's important to uh, understand that as well. But yeah, again, like I think. We might be heading towards a second lockdown or something. Mm -hmm. So again, uh, you know, build a community around you and show that you have the social ties uh, that can help you, um, you know, know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala better, build a relationship with Allah, have a transformative environment where, where you're at university. It, it, it will have a good impact on your mental health, your welfare as well. And again, you know, like even if we go into lockdown, um, some of our righteous predecessors and people who came after them, people like Imam Ibn Qayyim, rahimahullah, some of the things that they say is like the best relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they were able to construct that when they were they were in solitude, when they were mm. in uh, prisons and jails. So seek khalwa, khalwa with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, use it as an opportunity. 
Uh, but yeah, that would be my message. Jazakallah khair. And now, Mr. President. Uh, I mean, I think Jalal pretty much summarized what forces it really tries to push and um, encourage. I mean, we always tell ISOX, you know, Islamic society, there's a problem with that phrase because Islamic is not an English word. Like the Islam bit is it's an Arabic word. So you have to translate it. And when you translate it, Islam just means submission to Allah. So the Islamic society on campus is the submission to Allah society on campus. And fundamentally, that's your job. Whatever activity you do, however much money you're raising, you know, whatever it is, you, your, your intention should always to be to bring people back and build a relationship with Allah. And once they have that, it doesn't matter what label they're being influenced under. It doesn't matter what's going on around them. They have their anchor. Do you get it? They have their anchor. And that anchor will eventually always pull them back home. And home is with Allah. <clears throat> and uh, brothers and sisters in the Islamic societies, the leadership and the Muslim students who are going to university and have been part of university, as long as they remember that, they will always be safe and they'll always be protected. And Allah is the greatest of protectors and He is the one who we seek help and protection and aid and success from. Zakhla <laughs> Khan, brothers. And Zakhla uh, Khan for you guys at home watching. Uh, if you like this podcast, give it a like and a share. Remember to comment below. Um, let us know what you think and uh, get your. Um, top uh, piece of advice for students, uh, Muslim students as well. Uh, speaking of advice for Muslim students, obviously check out FOSIS. We'll um, link their, <coughs> their resources uh, in the description below, inshallah. Um, also, stay tuned to Islam Tuesday this week and next week. And in the coming few weeks, we're going to be uh, sharing more and more contents uh, speci specifically uh, catered towards uh, students, um, Muslim students in particular. Uh, we're even releasing a journal soon, inshallah, sh a little uh, surprise, oops, uh, Muslim student journal to uh, to help you uh, navigate this uh, tricky terrain. And uh, until then, um, yeah, that's it from me. Remember to subscribe, click the bell notification, all that good stuff, wherever you find your uh, podcast. Uh, from me and the Sam Transfer team, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Uh, uh,